Welcome to our third podcast in collaboration with Mindful on Wall Street. Uh, today we talk to Nathan Romano. He's the president of Atalaya Capital on Wall Street. And um, he will share with us his personal story on how he became contemplation practitioner, med meditator, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, mindfulness meditation, and how he applies it into his daily life at work, uh, as well as in his personal life. So without further ado, uh, I welcome you to listen to Nathan Romano and Sander Tiedemann of the Garrison Institute. Thank you, Anamik. And uh, hello, uh, Nathan. So nice to see you. Uh, we met uh, two years ago when Hi, we, Sander. Launched the, we launched the Compassionate Leadership in Finance program, Cliff, at Garrison Institute. And you were one of our first participants. And uh, it was a great joy and pleasure to meet you. And uh, I want to start off with the question like you know what did that mean to you what what resonated from that program where we are we're engaged in in contempt of practice mindfulness but also in compassion training uh and uh and applying that to leadership in the financial sector in you know of course competitive markets difficult uh, challenging conditions so love to hear what resonated and how you're bringing that into your life at the moment it's a it's a great place to start and thank you both for for having me um such an honor uh, to be involved in this. So when I first heard about the compassionate leadership and finance effort, my reaction was, wow, it's about time I'm seeing something like this. Um, it's incredible that somebody had the courage, you know, to actually put this together. It's needed incredibly badly by our industry. And then my second reaction was, wow, am I really going to be like a poster child for this? <laughs> you know, A, what are the risks involved? And B, how the hell did I get here? Like, you know, I am not the type of person that if I look back on my 14-year-old self or 25-year-old self, um, that would have thought that this would be something um, that I would be involved in, you know, at this stage of my life and career. Uh, and, you know, I guess it is a good place to make sense with the beginning of that journey. But, um, I will say, as it re relates to Cliff, Compassionate Leadership and Finance, um, it's been an incredible experience. I've learned so much about myself and about our industry and about others that are playing a leadership role. Um, it's a movement that's taking off on its own, and it's taking off on its own because it's needed. You know, it's an industry that is very demanding, um, that is not very forgiving, and people are under a lot of anxiety and people are making you know, really important decisions, not life and death decisions for the most part, um, but they're making really important decisions that impact the lives of thousands and often millions of people around the world in terms of what projects are financed, where does capital flow? Um, so very big macro subjects, but also micro subjects of how's my own mental health? How am I managing my career? How am I, you know, um, continuing to thrive in a unbelievably competitive and demanding environment while also looking out for, for myself, Bob, for being a good partner, you mm -hmm. know, at home, for being a good parent, for being a good friend. Um, Cause this is not a career path that leaves a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's an incredible effort that, you know, a lot of leadership around wall street banks, insurance companies, you know, asset management organizations are actually stepping up and saying, taking care of yourself and taking care of the community matters. Yeah. And actually that's in the best long-term interest of our organization as well, because we need healthy people to work with and we need to do what's right for, for society in order to sustain our own profitability. So I think, you know, it's the time. Um, how I got into it is a little bit of a, you know, crazy story. I grew up in Queens and then Long Island, New York in a Wall Street um, family, but like, you know, nothing fancy, both neither of my parents went to college, but grew up, you know, their started their career in the 70s when Wall Street was taking off and hiring people in operations all over the place. And, you know, they were fortunate enough to ride that wave, but it was a bumpy, bumpy wave. So there's a lot of volatility in the household's earnings, um, ups and downs. And so it was a very emotional household. Um, I also grew up with a mom, which we'll talk about later with, you know, that I've been pretty open about with severe bipolar disorder. So that by definition is bumpy and volatile and up and downs. And I was an only child. So, you know, I grew up in a very um, dynamic household, good and bad. Mm -hmm. And 
by the time I got to college, you know, I was a pretty emotional guy. And I was also incredibly competitive, both academically and athletically. And I thought that was a good thing for the most part, you know, brought a lot of passion to what I did, but you know, it also left a trail of damage sometimes. And when I got to college and I was playing tennis, my tennis coach, I went to California and who knew in 1988 what meditation was, but my Cali, you know, my, the coach and uh, basically said like, you should really try meditating. You're kind of out of control <laughs> on the court. You should get the best of your, you know, you should learn how to control your emotions. It'll help you, you know, and, for anybody that grew up watching John McEnroe, that was almost like, what? What do you mean? He's the most emotional guy in the world. So <laughs> um, so I never listened to him. And then one day I lost a match I should have won. And it was because I kind of lost a little bit of control at my emotions. And it all came from being incredibly hard on myself and negative self-talk and, you know, and not just being able to let go and move on to the next point. And um and so I said, okay, I went to practice and I was like, I think you're right. I, what do I do? And he's like, okay, you got to drive to Santa Monica. You got to go to this little office in an office building and the corner. And it's like one person, it's the foundation of human understanding and ask for their book. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, okay, you know, so I had to get a ride there and get the book and took a couple of weeks and, um, the book came with a tape and the tape basically, you know, he says, sit down on a chair. You had your Walkman tape, you know, using a Walkman back in the day, yeah, yeah. Uh, sit down in your chair, try to clear your mind, take some breaths and then put your, you know, index finger and thumb together and, you know, try to feel your pulse. That's it. Focus on your pulse. And it was a half an hour tape and it, you know, and it kind of said, you know, just keep focusing on your pulse, clear your mind, clear your mind. And my mind was racing about everything like this yeah. is so stupid why am i doing this what if somebody walks by and sees me doing this like this can't be legit um and i got so fr you know and i have work to do and i have friends to go see and i have tennis to practice and i don't have time for this and um and literally after like seven to ten minutes i couldn't clear my mind you know i just couldn't do it it was what they called monkey mind and um i stood up and i threw my chair out my window of my dorm and I got in huge trouble and yeah. um, it didn't like <laughs> go through the window and hurt anybody, but it kind of shattered the window. And I went back to practice the next day and I was like, okay, I think you got a point. I think, you know, I'm not in control of my emotions and you know, what do I do from here? And he's like, look, just keep listening to the tape. Just keep putting your fingers together. That's it. Um, mm. And so I did, you know, I did. And it, um, it really, got me on a journey of understanding, you know, that my mind was just a movie projector that was never going to stop. It was like yeah. perpetual movie projections of thoughts, too many of them negative, some of them a lot of fun when I was having fun. Um, and that I needed to somehow get control. And I actually made the analogy, I don't know if it was right or wrong, but I said, you know, my mom is not in control of her thoughts. She's very volatile. And and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put my kids through that volatility. I don't want to have that. So I became a serious student of meditation. Hmm. Fascinating. Well, I don't want to stop you. You're, you're on a roll. But I mean, you clearly you have a very interesting background because you, of course, you had also a stellar career in finance. You still have, you know, you're very active as a, as a, as a president uh, of Atalaya Capital. And uh, but you're also this mental health thing is, you know, have also, you know, an incredible dedication to uh to working in that space, right through NAMI, and and so it seems you are on a, on a path of purpose, uh, way beyond yeah. just you talk about controlling your emotions and all this sort of thing, and you know, let's say the the, the basics of of mindfulness, but you are, you're taking a few leaps further and applying it into your life, and 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 therefore also I think that the term compassionate leadership really applies to you when I listen to you and and look at your life story. How how is that translating in those big choices like for Nami, your career choices, the way you lead uh, your organization, your teams, etc.? You want to share a little bit on that sure. too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look. I'm, first of all, I'm just very fortunate that the way that the trends of society have gone have brought mental health to the forefront. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, no, nobody would talk about mental health. It was completely swept under the rug, and bad outcomes happened. So, you know, that's lucky you know, meditation and just impulse control, you know, has become more acceptable, you know, um, which is great. Um, uh, and then, you know, it's become more 
acceptable and discussed in the workplace as well, not just in general society, but in the workplace. So I'm just lucky that all those trends came together. I would say like, you know, I didn't grow up with a family where we had like definitive rules, like, you know, or philosophies that led life. It was always be kind, have friends, do the right thing. That was kind of it. Um, but also excel, like you gotta get, you gotta do well and you gotta get good grades and, 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 but then when I started getting into meditation and I started learning about what is compassion and hearing about compassion and started reading some books about Buddhism and understanding that, like, it made a lot of sense to me, you know, that what you put in is what you get out and that karma is legit. And that what really matters is how you treat other people. Um, and so I brought that to, you know, I always bring my full self to everything I do to my life for good or for bad. And so I embraced it and I brought that kind of management and teammate style to work. And, you know, in a field where, you know, there usually wasn't a lot of empathy and people were competing for jobs and titles and promotions. And so, it was, um, you know, a lot of me against him or her, you know, I started to bring a different approach and um, it sort it really, it really worked. And what it, what it led to was a lot of people wanting to work for me. And so I kept getting more responsibility. Um, and you know, it takes a lot of you to listen to people and to get to know them and to hear them out. But I think what, what it really taught me and what I really have turned into over 30 years of doing this, you know, but I didn't, that certainly didn't start out this way, um, is, you know, I've really gotten to be good at putting myself in other people's shoes okay. and, you know, understanding where they're coming from. You know, there's an awesome graphic as well as a statement that like, you know, there's a graphic of a circle you know, big circle and then a little dot maybe near the, you know, the center, you know, the radius of the circle, you know, and it's a tiny dot and it says, you know, this is how much you know about someone else's life. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so like, you might get frustrated at somebody at work, but you have no idea what they're going through at home. You have no idea what they're going through personally. And you may have to make ultimately the tough decision of like, Hey, you're not right for this project or you're not right for this job. And it could, you, and, and I'm not right for this sometimes, but, um, but still, that doesn't mean you shouldn't bring some compassion. You know, you shouldn't yeah. give somebody the benefit of the doubt, you know. And and so I've tried to live my life that way. And it's helped me a lot at work. It's helped, certainly helped me a lot at home. Um, Can you say a little bit how it has helped at work? Because, of course, you know, as I said in the beginning, it's competitive markets, difficult conditions, you know. Yeah. Cutthroat, you have to, you know, really get things moving. Is, does compassion slow you down or how would you say, what are the main benefits of compassion? Yeah, look, I will say it's not a panacea. It doesn't work in terms of the definitions of winning on Wall Street all the time, but it long-term, you know, what a, the famous Goldman saying, long-term greedy, I think it's very much aligned with long-term greedy. You do the right thing by people, even if you have to make a big difficult decision or it leads to a suboptimal outcome, you don't win the deal. Um, they think highly of you. They remember how you were felt, how you made them feel if you were honest with them and somehow business comes back mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. Um, your reputation is also critically important and how you get to where you are. You can never change your reputation. That's very, very important to me. And so, um, you know, treating people with respect and even if, you know, again, even if like you have to let them go ultimately, you know, but being understanding of the situation that they're in has has paid a lot of good dividends and again i think you get the best out of people when they're motivated to work for you not out of fear you know there's obviously machiavelli and the prince you have different uh you know have a different philosophy that fear you know beats compassion but um that's just not who i am it's not you know it's worked for many people but it's not who i am and so i follow my true self and i've seen it pay significant dividends and you know the long-term npv of positive relationships which leads to clients you know mm. either in banking or in asset management wanting to do more with you beautiful well thank you could you say a few things like what is the core practice that you do every day or every week you know what how, how do you sure um, so I do three things um, in the following order. Uh, one is I love yoga. You know, this meditation actually got me into yoga and just because I've been athletic, I guess, and physical, like that's where I need to have yoga, the, you know, the mind-body connection. So I do 10 minutes of 15 minutes of yoga every morning and, you know, some longer classes on the weekends when I can, but that just sets the day and gets my engine running. And, and then I, uh, now that I commute, actually, for the first time, it's it's a lot easier. I, I meditate on the train for 20 minutes. I do TM, 
I've tried lots of different meditation styles, but TM, transcendental meditation, is the one that I find the most um, easiest to do and, and have less mental barriers to getting into it. Uh, and then there's a universal loving kindness prayer, and I'm not a religious person or anything, but it basically offers compassion to all people and no matter what they're going through and i find that also very self um it 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 mellows my competitive natural <laughs> i want to go win and kill and it helps me get centered for you know doing what's right for the day well thank you so much it's amazing and there's so much more we could discuss and i'd like to explore with you uh but maybe not a podcast at one point you know because as a leader you're a true leader it's it also the whole relationship between compassion, mindfulness, and leadership. That's something quite fascinating to explore uh, with Thank people you. like you, like practice leaders in, in many ways. So maybe, Yannick, you have a, a final, um, you know, comment to make or, you know, conclusion to draw. What... Well, you know, it's it's unfortunate for, for those of you that can't see uh, Nathan right now, but uh, the one thing about Nathan is that he always carries his charismatic smile around his face. And as a result, you cannot just but listen to him. Uh, and so for, for all of those of Mindful on Wall Street, Nathan, that are listening right now, what would be your message um, in the daily lives of anybody at work at any level in the finance world uh, on Wall Street? And as you started with, you know, with the craziness that's going on and how busy people are and the stress and expectations that are always rising, um, what's your message? Um, for them in, in closing our, our podcast? That's a great question. Um, you know, every day, because of what I do with NAMI uh, and other things, like I get calls or emails from people that are dealing with a tremendous amount of anxiety or mental health issues for themselves or their family. And the biggest lesson of my life, and I think for people that are very wound, that are wound very tightly and very ambitious and want to make a difference in the world. It's not just ambitious for money, but want to make a difference and want to help people is, um, is self-compassion. Self-compassion is the number one thing. Like you can't, you, you got to be great to yourself. You got to treat yourself like you're your best friend and not be critical of yourself all the time because that leads to a lot of negative outcomes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for reminding us because Compassion has the connotation of sort of uh, serving others, but, you know, as you said, rightly, it's built on this uh, practice of self-compassion. It's kind of foundation, right? And, um, yeah, you can only give as much as you have, basically, right? So so that's very important to keep in mind. So thank you for that. But also thank you for sharing so openly and uh, um, and really oh, appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for doing this forum. This is terrific. Excited to listen to others. Well, thanks, thanks again, Nathan. This was terrific. And I hope that for those of you listening, um, you know, write down the questions that you have um, and don't hesitate to send a note to either Sander or myself. Um, so if we can do a follow-up um, podcast in, in the weeks and months ahead, we would love to make sure that we are addressing those issues that you are excited about and want to learn more about. So thanks again, and thanks you for listening. Thank, Thank you. you.